Well, good evening, everybody. It's, it's such a privilege to be here. Mark, thank you. Becky, thank you. I can hardly tell you what a privilege it is for Janet and me to be here and to be invited to the Linear Theological Library. I don't usually spend a lot of time at the beginning of a lecture with personal reflections, but unfortunately for you tonight, I'm going to depart from my normal practice because I want to set in context my topic for the evening which is avoiding idolatry, or to put it more positively, worshiping God. And part of worship is giving thanks, and it's my conviction that one can spread one's thanks around without diminishing one's thankfulness to God. In other words, thankfulness is not a zero-sum game. And if you're making mental notes, uh, you'll notice later on in the lecture I come back to that phrase. Anyhow, I can't bear to leave all of my thanksgiving to the end, um, and also I want to steal a bit of Mark's thunder. So thank you again for inviting us to be here, your guests in Houston. And in case you don't know, Mark and Becky and Janet and I are what's known as a final kin, people joined by marriage. And I don't mean anything illegal. Mark is married to Becky and vice versa. And <laughs> Janet and I are married to each other. In fact, a, a week ago, we celebrated our 45th wedding anniversary, and that's something else I'm thankful for, though that's not what I'm going to lecture on this evening because I haven't yet received a PhD in marriage. <laughs> the Danielsons and Lanier's are a final kin because five months ago, Mark's son, Will, married Janet's and my daughter, Nora whose name you just heard. And now they're going by the name Danielson Lanier and living in Jerusalem. And when they hear the, or watch the video of this talk, they're going to be so embarrassed uh, to hear me mentioning them. But uh, my heart wells up with gratitude for that gift as well. And I also mention them for some very Miltonic reasons. In Paradise Lost, those of you who've read it, many more of you know the story roughly, Adam and Eve aren't just together, they're married. However, it's an arranged marriage. Neither Adam nor Eve did a lot of dating <laughs> before affirming their marriage choices. It was a divinely arranged marriage. And it was arranged in a way that actualized rather than diminished their God-given personal agency and freedom to choose. And it's my conviction that Nora's and Will's marriage was also arranged, though neither Mark nor I nor their mothers arranged it. Okay, John Milton wouldn't say arranged, he would say providential. And providence is something else I'm going to touch on at a couple of points in the lecture tonight, as you will see. And it's something else I am deeply, deeply thankful for. Now, I was told that not everyone here this evening will have sat down recently and read all the way through the 10,000 plus lines of Paradise Lost. So if you haven't, if you're a little short on the homework, just relax. I'm going to sketch a few basic things about the epic. It's not called a novel, it's called an epic. If you want to keep your Milton teacher happy, don't call it a novel. But it is a story in epic form. And you'll hear some of the lines of that epic in what follows. John Milton was born just over 400 years ago in 14, sorry, 1608. He became not only a poet, but also a writer who specialized 
in justifying controversial things. For example, in 1649, the English Parliament executed the English king, Charles I, by cutting off his head. And it was Milton who was given the job of writing a long pamphlet in Latin for European consumption, explaining why the Parliament of England had executed the king. So in his own lifetime, Milton was much better known as a regicide, a killer of kings, than as an epic poet. When the son of Charles I, Charles II, returned to the throne of England in 1660, it was time for Milton to keep his own head down, for obvious reasons, and he devoted his time to writing Paradise Lost, which was first published in 1667, 348 years ago. The great ancient epics of Greece and Rome had told long stories about big events shaping entire civilizations, such as the fall of Troy or the founding of Rome. But Milton aimed even higher. He wanted to write an epic about events that shaped the whole human race, and also to tell the story of the origins of the world and of human history in a way that glorified and justified God. And to do this, he needed divine help. So he began Paradise Lost with an invocation, a prayer, to what he calls the heavenly muse. Of man's first disobedience and the fruit of that forbidden tree whose mortal taste brought death into this world and all our woe with loss of Eden till one greater man restore us and regain the blissful seat. Sing, heavenly muse, that on the secret top of Oreb or of Sinai didst inspire that shepherd who first taught the chosen seed in the beginning how the heavens and earth rose out of chaos. Or if Zion Hill delight thee more, and Silo's brook that flowed fast by the oracle of God, I thence invoke thy aid to my adventurous song that with no middle flight intends to soar above the Aeonian mount while it pursues things unattempted yet in prose or rhyme. And chiefly thou, O spirit, that dost prefer before all temples the upright heart and pure, instruct me. For thou knowest, thou from the first wast present and with mighty wings outspread, dove-like sat brooding on the vast abyss and madest it pregnant. What in me is dark, illumine. What is low, raise and support that to the height of this great argument I may assert eternal providence and justify the ways of God to men. Among the many glorious things about Milton's epic is its range of characters, and perhaps Milton's most famous character, not surprisingly, is Satan, whose rhetoric wiles and psychology are put on full display. As you'll hear in a few minutes, I particularly want to examine Satan's theology. In Paradise Lost, we also see a lot of Adam and Eve before the fall. So if you want to take away a technical term with you tonight, the prelapsarian Adam and Eve, Adam and Eve before the fall. This is important for Milton. It's important for Milton that we get a good, detailed glimpse of what sinless life in the Garden of Eden might have been like. Milton doesn't want us thinking, as some critics have alleged, that paradise was a kind of old people's home or even club med with everything laid on 
in which eventually we would have become bored to death for lack of challenges and stimulation. In Milton's Eden, there's work to be done, hospitality to be shown to angels no less, conversations, even disagreements and misunderstandings that need to be negotiated and worked through, stories to be told, dreams to be interpreted, marriage to be consummated both intellectually and physically, cosmological theories to be pondered, and of course, temptations to be faced. And you know, even if you haven't read Paradise Lost, here's the standard spoiler alert, Adam and Eve do fall. They do fail to resist Satan's temptation. But for Milton's theodicy, his justification of the ways of God, he needs, if, if that's going to work, he needs to convince us that Adam and Eve could have resisted temptation, could have had a rich and fulfilling life had they remained obedient, and did, in their unfallen state, embody qualities and behaviors that even we fallen human beings can recognize as good, wholesome, and desirable. What this means <clears throat> is that in Paradise Lost, Milton gives us a series of very rich pictures both of wickedness in the person of Satan and of delightful virtue in the persons of, of the unfallen Adam and Eve. And when it comes to the huge issue of idolatry, we observe in Satan exactly what we should not do or think if we want to avoid idolatry, whereas in unfallen Adam and Eve, we observe what we should do if we are to worship God aright. I suppose we, most of us, know pretty much what idolatry is, biblically speaking, but let's conduct a quick review. Very simply, idolatry is a failure or refusal to obey the first commandment of the Decalogue. You may know that different traditions within Christianity number the Ten Commandments differently. Some include the prohibition of graven images in the first command, in, inside the first commandment, and others count it as a separate second commandment. And that's not my main concern, because God's command, thou shalt have no other gods before me, is sufficient of itself to prohibit idolatry, which is precisely any act or attitude that displaces God as our principal object of worship. The generally idolatrous tendency or state of the human race is summed up by the Apostle Paul in Romans 1. I think this is the largest bit of text I'm going to put in front of you tonight. So, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. One translation says, stifle the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, theotes, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. So they are without excuse. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give him thanks. But they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. So, what I want to notice here is the assumption on the part of the Apostle Paul that our knowing and perceiving God's eternal power and divine nature is the foundation upon which our honoring and thanking Him are built. I'm going to repeat that because it's probably the most important sentence I'm uttering tonight. Our knowing or perceiving God's eternal power and divine nature is the foundation upon which our honoring and thanking him are built. Note furthermore that it is a both and. 
We honor God and give God thanks when we properly recognize both his power and his theotes, usually translated divinity, deity, or divine nature. And the key premise here, and this is in keeping with most commentators, that word implies goodness. We worship a God who is both all-powerful and all-good, not just one or the other, but both. In Paradise Lost, however, Milton shows us how a refusal to worship God arises from bad theology, from a conception of God that admits his power but suppresses or stifles any recognition of his goodness. Milton's epic opens with Satan and the other fallen angels already in hell, but trying to plot further rebellion against God and revealing to attentive readers how bad theology supports and fuels the devil's own rebellion. Satan suggests that God's goodness or right is merely arbitrary, merely a function of God's possessing superior firepower. Since he who now is sovereign can dispose and bid what shall be right, farthest from him is best, whom reason hath equaled, force hath made supreme. Satan insinuates that God's sovereignty might be temporary, who now is sovereign, and that it is based merely on his superior weaponry, his force, with right being a mere function of might. And many others through history, of course, have proposed the same relationship between might and right. From, from Plato's Thrasymachus to Thomas Hobbes in Milton's day to Nietzsche in the 19th century to Chairman Mao and others in the 20th and I'm sure you could extend the list into the 21st century. It is a devastating philosophy, and all the more devastating when it assumes theological form. In the case of Milton's Satan, it seems to justify a refusal of the worship of God. As Satan declares, he will never bow and sue for grace with suppliant knee and deify his God's power. And think about it. This refusal does have a certain logic to it. For consider that our word worship comes from the older English form worth-ship. To worship God is to declare his worth-ship. However, if you believe that all worth is purely arbitrary and determined by sheer power, how can you worship in the fullest, most robust sense of the word? You can't. But of course, far from agreeing with Satan's position, I'm only suggesting that in unrighteousness, Satan is suppressing the truth about God's theotes, his divinity, his goodness, and that we must be scrupulous in our own theology not to do the same. In Paradise Lost, the unfallen Adam and Eve, by contrast, show us how good theology, a theology that does not suppress recognition of either God's power or theotes, leads them straight into acts of glorious worship. After a day of performing enjoyable work in the garden, before entering their bower to make love and enjoy a good night's sleep, they turn and hold hands and offer up an evening prayer to God. Thou also made the night maker omnipotent, and thou the day, which we in our appointed work employed have finished happy in our mutual help and mutual love, the crown of all our bliss ordained by thee, 
And this delicious place for us too large, where thy abundance wants partakers and uncropped falls to the ground. But thou hast promised from us to a race to fill the earth. And we're the readers thinking, that's us, right? A race to fill the earth who shall with us extol thy goodness infinite, both when we wake and when we seek, as now, thy gift of sleep. So as you can see, the prayer embodies a joyful recognition both of God's power and of his goodness. Elsewhere, in another prayer that Adam and Eve offer up, they exult in God's goodness beyond thought and power divine. Again, the both and of Romans 1 that functions as a foundation of their worship and of our worship. Milton's contemporary Nathaniel Holmes likewise points to the fundamental connection between worship and the goodness of God in his comment on Psalm 119. This is a contemporary of Milton's, of course. Thou art good and dost good. That's, that's he's quoting there. Which and may according to the Hebrew be meetly translated therefore. Namely, thou art good, therefore thou dost good. But however we translate, these two are chained together as the necessary cause and the infallible effect that God doth good because he is good. And upon both as on a foundation is built the knowledge, faith, and hope of good David, what to think and expect of God. No wonder then that Satan's rebellion against God and his refusal to acknowledge God's goodness should likewise be chained together. So at this point I want to change gears a little bit without changing direction and it's time for an advertisement. This past November, Cambridge University Press published my new study of Paradise Lost and the Cosmological Revolution. And I'd like to share with you just a few things I learned while writing the book, still on the topic of avoiding idolatry and being reminded of God's power and theotes. In particular, I'd like to ponder the place and role of the sun. That, this is the cover of the book with a graphic that's borrowed from a 1640 publication by the clergyman, um, John Wilkins, who was also a convinced Copernican. And I, I would love to spend time exegeting this picture with you, but I'm just going to zoom in on the top part of it. As you may know, the great Christian astronomer Copernicus began an astronomical and cosmological revolution with his suggestion that Earth orbits around the sun, not vice versa. And here's the detail of the picture that shows the happy-faced sun in the middle. And if those circles aren't perfectly round, it's a function of modern technology rather than any misunderstanding on the part of 17th century writers. To us, it doesn't feel as if Earth is turning about once every day or flying through space in an annual circuit of almost 300 million miles. But Copernicus and his followers said that we are undergoing those motions, though, of course, most sensible people for the next 200 years thought he was crazy and wouldn't believe it. Because can you feel the Earth moving? It seems to fly in the face of common sense. Nonetheless, if you did accept Copernicanism, also known as heliocentrism, because helios, the sun, is now conceived to be in the center, then the role of the sun as a sort of ruler of the universe was much enhanced. Um, and you can see there's, the sun is talking in this picture and saying in Latin, you didn't know that the sun spoke Latin, but he does. Um, <laughs> Omnibus do lucem calorem motum. To all things I give light and warmth and motion. 
Here's what Copernicus wrote about the sun. Behold, in the midst of all resides the sun. For who in this beautiful temple would set this lamp in another or better place whence to illuminate all things at once? For aptly indeed, do some call him the lantern, others the mind or the ruler of the universe. Trismegistus calls him the visible God and Sophocles Electra, the beholder of all things. Truly indeed, does the sun, as if seated upon a royal throne, govern his family of stars as they circle about him. And this isn't Copernicus's picture, but it's based on Copernicus's picture. You can see the, the family of planets and stars circling about the sun. Okay. There's something, there's, uh, excuse me, there's nothing necessarily idolatrous about Copernicus's lively and florid description of the sun. But we can sense the possible dangers if one were to forget the creational context that Paul mentions in Romans 1. We can say that the sun is a symbol or reflection of God, but that doesn't entail or justify making the sun an object of worship, as indeed it was in many ancient cultures. I was telling somebody over supper about the one visit I made to Egypt a few years ago where I visited Heliopolis, the city of the sun. The sun in ancient Egyptian, Babylonian, and so on, uh, was an object of, of worship. John Calvin, in his commentary on Genesis, the fourth day of creation, goes out of his way to assert that God is God and the sun is not despite its hugely important role in the world. So one of the phrases there is to rule, verse 16. Calvin writes, Moses does not ascribe such dominion to the sun and moon as shall in the least degree diminish the power of God. But because the sun in half the circuit of the heaven governs the day and the moon the night by turns, he therefore assigns to them a kind of government. Yet let us remember that it is such a government as implies that the sun is still a servant. So not only biblical commentators, but also biblical writers themselves were apparently aware of the danger of idolatry with regard to the heavenly bodies. This isn't too much of a stretch when you think about it. We still refer to the planets using the names of pagan gods. Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Neptune, Uranus. Pluto, god of the underworld, was especially ominous and I, for one, am perfectly happy that the International Astronomical Union just a few years ago demoted Pluto, <laughs> but I digress. The point here is that the Old Testament writers positively avoid the names of the heavenly bodies out of concern that even naming them could sound idolatrous. You may think that the Genesis account of the fourth day names the sun and the moon, but actually it doesn't. It refers to them only rather vaguely as lights created to give light upon the earth, a greater light and a lesser light. Some scholars have suggested that biblical writers avoided the Hebrew noun for the sun, shemesh, because it was too reminiscent, and I'm quoting a scholar here, it was too reminiscent of the Canaanite and Mesopotamian sun god, Shamash. Similarly, in the book of Job, the title character judges it necessary to profess that he never raised his hand in homage to the sun or the moon, although he too avoids Shemesh, employing instead the same word for light used in Genesis 1. Yet the same text clearly marks the obliquely referred to sun and moon, the Genesis text does, as having a kind of governmental function created to, quote, rule over the day and over the night, as we've already noticed in Calvin's commentary. 
Thus, biblically and in the exegetical tradition, the son does occupy a God-given place or role of honor and of government, yet one that is properly subservient. In Paradise Lost, two of the most theologically rich speeches begin as addresses to the son. One is spoken by Satan, the other by the unfallen Adam. They occur in different places in the epic, but they form a kind of diptych, you know, painting with two panels, revealing in effect two, two frames, of two, two images, two models that demonstrate respectively how not to and how to approach the created world. At the beginning of book four of Paradise Lost, Satan, determined to strike back at God by invading and damaging this world, our world, lands in Eden, and he looks up at the midday sun and utters this speech to the sun at midday. O thou that with surpassing glory crowned lookst from thy sole dominion like the God of this new world, at whose sight all the stars hide their diminished heads, To thee I call, but with no friendly voice, and add thy name, O son, to tell thee how I hate thy beams that bring to my remembrance from what state I fell, how glorious once above thy sphere. In this speech, Satan seems to err in two different directions almost at the same time. His idolatrous address ascribes to the son precisely such rule, sole dominion like the God of this new world, as Calvin says the Genesis account excludes. As one critic rightly points out, it's fundamental for Milton that we acknowledge works or created things so as to distinguish them from their divine creator, God, the great work master. But Satan utterly fails or refuses to make this distinction. So in his soliloquy to the son, he in effect addresses shamash rather than shamesh. Still, his characteristically resentful response to divinity immediately turns his attitude to rivalry and hostility. He reads the star's response to the son in terms of competition. At his sight, they hide their diminished heads he says. Here again is Satan's zero-sum logic. The brightness or glory of something else or someone else, be it the sun in the sky or the son of God at the Father's right hand, must entail, he thinks, a diminution of himself. It's always about him. And so in this soliloquy, in his hatred for the son, and for the enlightenment it seems to force upon him, Satan boasts that his own former state, glorious above thy sphere, in fact, surpassed the surpassing glory of the sun. Within eight lines, he thus manages both to idolize and then to depreciate one of the creator's most excellent works. For Satan, there's something indeed about the sun that is both repulsive and attractive. And of course, even before the speech we've just looked at, the sun catches his eye. It is said that it allures his eye. And this bespeaks Satan's susceptibility to temptation and the possibility of idolatry that observing heavenly bodies opens up, and if you find a double entendre there, that's up to you. Yet among heavenly bodies, the sun is a symbol without peer. Many writers, for example, refer to it with the epithet, eye of the world. This can be traced back to Ovid's metamorphosis, mundi oculus, and it also finds resonance in Shakespeare, sonnet 18, the eye of heaven. And the great astronomer, Johannes Kepler, uh, he also uses the phrase, the lordly eye. I won't quote a lot of Latin to you tonight. Um, Moreover, the main Christian 
tradition finds no contradiction, despite the presence of danger, in honoring the sun, S-U-N, reading it symbolically and acknowledging it as a divine work. This balance is nicely summarized by St. Ambrose, 4th century AD. Do not without due consideration put your trust in the sun. It is true that it is the eye of the world, the joy of the day, the beauty of the heavens, the charm of nature, and the most conspicuous object in creation. When you behold it, reflect on its author. When you admire it, give praise to its creator. It's just the antithesis of what we see in Satan in Paradise Lost. But in fact, it's the recipe that's followed by the unfallen Adam in the same poem. And this is the second panel of the diptych. When Adam awakes, when he's first created, he's got a lot to learn because he knows nothing. And God's just created him from the dusts of the earth and he wakes up and it happens to be midday. And he looks up at the sun to start with and then around at the rest of creation. And he's describing this experience to an angel, the angel Raphael. And he recognizes immediately that the sun is part of a greater fabric of creation. Thou sun, said I, fair light. And thou enlightened earth, so fresh and gay, ye hills and dales, ye rivers, woods and plains, and ye that live and move, fair creatures, tell, tell if ye saw, how came I thus, how here, not of myself, by some great maker then, in goodness and in power preeminent. Tell me, how may I know him, how adore. Instinctively recognizing himself and his surroundings, including the sun, as creatures, Adam is led by ineluctable logic toward the creator. Adam and Eve together, later in time but earlier in the poem, similarly address their morning psalm to all created things, including the sun, calling them to join in worshiping the creator, thou sun of this great world, both eye and soul, acknowledge him, thy greater, sound his praise. Notice how the good theology leads to praise. Of course, both these utterances are informed by the speaker's sinless assumption that far from being in competition with their implied audiences, nature, sun, the sky, the animals, and certainly not coerced or threatened by the creatures they address, they are partners with creation in a shared enterprise of adoration and worship. Again, as in Romans 1, a recognition of both God's power and his theotes serves as a foundation upon which we creatures can honor him as God and give him thanks. The association of God with light such a commonplace that I hardly need emphasize it further. It's certainly not surprising that the sun, S-U-N, as our main cosmological source of light, should serve as a potent symbol of divine characteristics. Perhaps especially in the English language, it seems almost natural that the sun, S-U-N, should symbolize the sun, S-O-N. In Paradise Lost, the Son of God appears already in heaven, offering himself as an atonement for humankind. The unfallen angels who hear this announcement break forth into a hymn of praise to both Father and Son. They celebrate, first, the Father, author of all being, fountain of light, thyself invisible amidst the glorious brightness where thou sitst, throned inaccessible. But when thou shades the full blaze of thy beams and through a cloud drawn round about thee like a radiant shrine, dark with excessive bright, thy skirts appear yet dazzle heaven. 
And next they sing, begotten son, divine similitude, in whose conspicuous countenance, without cloud made visible, the almighty father shines. It's an echo of the first chapter of Hebrews, of course. Whom else no creature can behold, on thee impress the effulgence of his glory abides, transfused on thee his ample spirit rests. A little bit more than a decade after Milton's death in 1674, and the publication in 1688, came of, of a, a folio edition. You bibliophiles know the folio edition is a big, big version of, uh, of a book, a big version of Paradise Lost. And it, its feature was that each of the 12 books of Paradise Lost um, had a frontispiece, had a plate illustrating some aspect of the poem. And this is the one that appeared, well, it appeared a few moments ago at the beginning of the lecture, but here, here it is again, uh, at the beginning of book three of the 1688 folio edition of Paradise Lost. The, author, or the artist's name is Medina. And what Medina offers us is a visual version of the sun, sun, pun. He overlays the scene of the son offering himself as the atonement for humankind in book three with the scene in the following book, which we've looked at, in which Satan curses the light of the sun. Medina realizes that Satan's real hatred is more directed at the sun, S-O-N, than at the sun, S. -O -N. UN. So th th he's giving us his interpretation of that speech of Satan's that we looked at earlier. What's really bothering Satan is hatred of the S-O-N. For his part, however, Milton not only records the unfallen angel's hymn of praise to both father and son, he also himself, as a poet, as a person, as a Christian, joins in that praise. Recognizing God's power and theotes, and moreover, recognizing how these are communicated by Christ himself. And he, in effect, encourages us, too, to sing along with him. These are the angels in book three celebrating the announcement of the coming atonement and incarnation. No sooner did thy, spoken to the Father, no sooner did thy dear and only Son perceive thee purposed not to doom frail man so strictly, but much more to pity inclined. He to appease thy wrath and end the strife of mercy and justice in thy face discerned. Regardless of the bliss wherein he sat, second to thee, offered himself to die for man's offense. O oh, unexampled love, love nowhere to be found less than divine. Hail, Son of God, Savior of men. Thy name shall be the copious matter of my song henceforth, and never shall my heart thy praise forget, nor from thy Father's praise disjoin. This is a song that's sung by the angels, but toward the end of it, you can see Milton almost forgets that the angels are singing it, and he lapses into the first person the copious matter of my song. And de facto, I'm suggesting, invites us to do the same. Milton's unfallen Adam and Eve, along with the worshiping angels who sing this hymn, offer us epic lessons in how to avoid idolatry. And which is the same thing, how to turn our hearts to God's power and goodness as the foundation and motivation for worship. This picture, along with Paradise Lost as a whole, offers us a choice. We can join Satan in suppression of the truth and in withholding of due praise, or we can join Milton and the unfallen Adam and Eve and those angels who, whose attention is focused on praising Christ, who is the effulgence of God's glory. 
Now, yesterday, I promised Mark that I would add a footnote to my talk tonight, and here's the footnote. The question yesterday at the seminar, at the panel discussion was, what is your favorite illustration of Paradise Lost? And until a few years ago, probably my favorite illustration was the one that I showed you a moment ago from John Baptist Medina, because I think it's brilliant to superimpose the image of the sun over the image of the S-U-N and to suggest that that's Satan's motivation. It's maybe just a little hard to see. It's a black and white, um, it's an etching. It was made by an artist by the name of Kristen Behe who lives in, uh, not so far from Vancouver. Uh, and I'll tell you the story about, about this, if I may. Um, I'm quite proud of this in a way, not because I did it, but because I commissioned it. Um, in 2008, partly to celebrate John Milton's 400th birthday, uh, Regent College helped me publish a very low-budget uh, edition of my parallel prose to Paradise Lost. So if, if you ever wanted to read Paradise Lost but don't do poetry, um, Sorry for the advertisement, but they, you know, it's a parallel prose edition. And I got the idea from parallel New Testaments and that sort of thing. And so the original text of Paradise Lost is on the left, and my prose version, paraphrase, is on the right. And I wanted to do something special for the cover and for the frontispiece. And I do not have an artistic bone in my body, so I needed help. And I had the princely sum of $300 to spend commissioning an artist. And you know, Michelangelo wasn't available for that price. <laughs> but this wonderful young woman, talented, um, I, through my co contacts at Regent College, um, approached her, told her what I wanted to do. She nodded and uh, she makes these um, scratch etchings. And so she said, well, I've never read Paradise Lost. And I said, well, Here's my manuscript. So she actually didn't read it in the original. She read my version. And this lovely illustration for the cover came from her reading of, of that work. And I just want to talk about this picture and tell you just for a moment uh, why I appreciate it so much. Well, of course, at the center of the picture are Adam and Eve and the tree. And they've already eaten. They've already fallen. And they're in grief and terror. And notice they're turned away from each other because with sin comes human alienation and discord. The tree, probably bigger than most apple trees, if it was an apple, uh, that we've seen. And what have they been doing? Well, for one thing, in the f almost foreground, there's a wreath on the ground because when Adam was coming to see Eve, it was almost lunchtime and he hadn't seen her all morning and he wanted to find out how things were and then he realized that she'd fallen and his fingers go slack and the wreath of flowers drops from his hands, from his hand and Milton says, and all the faded roses shed their petals. So there's, there's a wonderful natural image of, of the falling of nature along with the falling of humankind. And then the ground is scattered with apples, pieces of fruit that have had one bite taken out of them. This was you know, the fruit that was attractive to the eye and looked good to eat. They take one bite, throw it away. Another bite, throw it away. Another bite, throw it away. Those of you who know Augustine's Confessions can figure out where that image might have come from because in sin, there is no satisfaction. And so there the ground is scattered with apples. And they're grieving about this. And this drama is a drama that's being played out against a cosmic background. If you look through the foreground, past the tree, you can see the stars. This is something that happens in a universe created by God and it has significance for that universe. And in fact, it's got spectators. 
angels left and right are concerned, even though they're holding back. So it's a drama that's played out against a cosmic background with angelic interest. Oh, yes, you've also noticed the serpent. And I had one, one person who reviewed the book and said, you know, serpents not, aren't that large. And I thought, you don't get it. This is a symbolic picture. Yes, the serpent is that large. And who's he looking at as his next victim? Me and you. But then at the top of the picture, encompassing the whole story, in a, almost in a different dimension, but a dimension that intersects with our world, is the crucified Christ whose arms are stretched on the cross but ready to embrace those who have fallen. There's a poem by John Donne that goes a little bit like this for a few lines. We think that paradise and Calvary, Christ's cross, and Adam's tree stood in one place. Look, Lord, and find both Adam's met in me as the first Adam's sweat surrounds my face. May the last Adam's blood my soul embrace. And the symmetry and the typology of that poem is captured in this picture by Kirsten B. who got all this from reading uh, Paradise Lost through once in a paraphrase edition, and that not just pleased me immensely, it instructed me immensely. Because she recognized that Paradise Lost is a Christocentric poem. It's focused on the person and the work of Christ. The Son of the Father, to whom be all praise, honor, and glory, now and forever. Amen, and thank you very much. As you're passing your questions in, I have a couple of my own that I, I uh, wanted to ask you about. Very few of us, thank you, Philip, very few of us uh, in here probably worship the sun, but many of us have our own idols. Mm. Can you help us understand, and this is a tough question, but hey, I'm a lawyer. Can you help us understand how we might be instructed to be careful about our own idols that may not be the sun, but we carry the same principles that you've got, yeah, that yeah. you've been explaining. You, you, I'm not asking a clear question, but can you help no, with you that? Are. Yes, yes, you are. Um, I sort of had a little talk with myself before, not immediately before, but as I was preparing this lecture, I'm, I'm not going to go in there and moralize to people about their individual idols, but the question is, is a highly valid one. I should probably ask it more of myself than, than of others. What, what things in life might, I, might be so important to me as to displace my love of God, my worship of God. And it's, for me, it's a tough question because, as I, as I indicated, I don't believe that thanksgiving, or even worship, is a zero-sum game. There's that wonderful line in the um, Anglican marriage service where the husband says to the wife, with my body I thee worship. Is that idolatrous? I don't think so. I mean, I guess it could be. <laughs> um, but I don't think it is because we acknowledge the worship of other people, of great architecture, of art and fun and all the good things that God's given us. But if we forget where they come from, 
if we think, I was talking to Charles about this over supper, if we, if we get to the point where we can't or won't say, this is all of grace, this is all a gift of God, I haven't earned it, how did I get to be so, it's not a good theological term, but how did I get to be so lucky as to be here, to have the wife and family that I have, to, there's so many good things in the world. I, I think acknowledging those good things enhances our worship, but there's always that worm of danger that they will become our objects of worship, a kind of obsessive focus. And that's just, you know, that's broken field running. That, that, that is not a play that I can call from the sidelines or as the quarterback. Um, because those moments of worship will catch you by surprise. And sometimes they're you know, kind of trivial and laughable. I remember when I was 11 years old, I'd ordered a new bike. I always had used bikes. And I got a new bike and it was, it was delivered to my house and there it was, shiny and new. And I actually found myself falling to my knees. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> and I thought, n n at, 11, at 11 years old, I understood, no, 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 you do not worship a new bike. But, but the tendency is there, and uh, it's not a tendency that goes away. Okay, so a related question. How do you deal with your idols? Oh, thank you very much. Um, <laughs> well, I'm sure um, sometimes not very well. Okay, I'm an academic. Uh, academics have a particular, particular set of idols I think they struggle with. You know, what makes universities tick is that nasty word prestige. And it's very easy when you're in an academic life to be looking for prestige. How can, you, how can you put your name in lights? They're not very big lights, they're academic lights. Um, they're not very remunerative lights, but they're lights, okay? <laughs> and um, and you, can get on that, you can get on that treadmill, I can get on that treadmill and become kind of obsessive to the point where I forget that, you know, the success or failure d doesn't establish my, my worth as a human being, my worth as a creature of God, my worth as a servant of God. They're good things, you know? I, I, look, I bragged earlier, I got a book published by Cambridge University Press. I'm really happy about that. Um, you know, check for four figures, really. <laughs> um, but I'm, I'm really happy about it, but, but it's simply something, something for which I just have to say thank you, because there were so many things that went into that, that some of them were my own doing. God has given me agency and the capacity to, to make choices, but so much of it is just, even the things that I choose myself are of grace, because God's given me those capacities. I've never read Paradise Lost. I'm reluctant to do so because Milton has added material to the biblical narrative. Yeah, yeah. I am afraid of confusing the facts of the Bible with speculation or imagination of what may have happened. How would you answer that concern? Oh, I'm delighted with the clarity of, of the question uh, because it is a concern. Let me start with just a kind of knee-jerk skeptical response. How many sermons have you ever attended where the minister restricted his or her own comments to quotations from scripture? Right? We, are, we are hermeneutical creatures. We, we, are, we are invited to interpret. Somebody once pointed out to me that Christianity is the only world religion whose key text 
is not in the language that was spoken principally by its founder. So the act of translation and the act of interpretation, I'm going to stick my neck out, is actually part of what it means to be a Christian. If we have a problem, we don't just quote the text. We certainly don't, you know, most of us don't quote the Greek or Hebrew text. We, we quote something that's already have had a degree of interpretation. I'm not saying anything goes. We've got to be critical and careful about that. Um, but the second part of the answer would be, you're quite right to be cautious. You're quite right to recognize that Paradise Lost is Milton's words. Paradise Lost is not scripture in spite of what some people think that we Miltonists believe. <laughs> it's not scripture. We can trace ways in which it is like scripture and perhaps in some ways uh, Milton has had almost an overwhelming emphasis on how people read the Bible, read Genesis 1 to 3 particularly. Um, but once you've got that problem identified, once you've got your antennae out, I think your problem's almost solved right there. Right. Which leads naturally to the next question, are there theological problems you see in the poem? Oh, I see theological problems all around me. Um, but yes, I see theological problems in the poem. Uh, Milton wanted to make God the Father as vivid a character as he could. And so he has scenes in which God speaks. And of course, they're God's words given to him by John Milton. <laughs> That's very tricky. Um, he also believed in God's foreknowledge, as do I. But when God appears in a poem, in a narrative, saying what's going to happen tomorrow or the next day or three months down the road, already, by the nature of narrative, which is a time-bound narrative, it's a sequential recounting of a story, um, God's timelessness, if that's what it is, God's transcendence of the category of time disappears. So he, he kind of paints himself into a corner theologically by making God appear as a character in the poem. I think that's a, by and large, a failing of the poem. There are perhaps others, but that's the main one that bothers me. Um, a question from someone about the poem. Did Satan and his demons roam about the chaotic earth before the creation of Adam and Eve and the Garden of Eden for a very, very long time? No. Um, the way the story unfolds in Paradise Lost, we begin with Satan and his cohort in hell. They're trying to figure out how to get back at God. And they know that he's very powerful. And so they think it would be a suicide mission to go and try and invade heaven again. And somebody says, you know, there was a, a, there was a prophecy in, in heaven that God was going to make another world with some new creature called man who was going to be the apple of his eye. Maybe, maybe that's already happened. And we can get back at God by invading that place, that cosmos, not just Earth, but that cosmos. And so that cosmos was, our world, was completed by God uh, before Satan arrived. Do you have any advice for new teachers of Paradise Lost? Lots. Um, Get people to, get students to read it out loud. Get the poetry out into the air. Because if you look at it on the page, it's lines of poetry. It's, they tend to be fairly long sentences. Um, but be patient with the language. Get the language into your mouth, and that's the best way of getting it into your head. So that would be one, one piece of advice. Um, another piece of advice would be don't don't worry too much about the big questions. Don't be stopped by the big questions that it raises. Who are we? Where did we come from? 
What's the nature of sin? Where, where did Satan come from anyhow? Why did God let this happen? And, and so on and so forth. You can continue the list. Those are wonderful questions, and they can provide energy and impetus to a reading of Paradise Lost. Um, but if you just kind of stop and argue about them all the time, you will do what the devils, according to Milton, do um, in, in hell while they're waiting for Satan to do his mission to earth. They will find no end in wandering mazes lost. What do you think Milton means by partakers? Okay, I'm just trying to remember the context. Partakers in all this bliss, I think. Uh, it's, it's... Oh, I don't know. Okay. <laughs> don't uh, it's, it's, it simply means sharing. Literally, partakers. And that's an important, brings another important point. I'm not, I'm not trying to avoid the question. But we human beings in this cosmos are partakers. I mentioned the phrase in connection with Satan, it's all about him. And one of the criticisms across history of Christianity is that we think it's all about us. And, you know, there's a lot that's about us, but it's a big universe. And, you know, maybe it's not all about us. One of the most dangerous words in the English language is the word merely. And you, you hear this repeatedly in cosmological discussions. We are merely a small planet in a small solar system in one of billions of galaxies. Get over yourself. Right? So the, the opposite extreme is enjoined. But it is partly about us. We are in the universe. That's a scientific fact. You can conduct experiments on yourself to prove that you're in the universe. <laughs> um, and while you're in the universe, you have a part to play and you have things to share with other people and with other creatures. And that's just a, an astonishing privilege. And Milton uses that wonderful old English word to describe it, bliss. It means blessedness. Can you comment on book nine, after Eve eats the apple, when one of her sins is to worship the tree of knowledge, offers hymns of praise, great, it, greet it daily. Interesting yeah. that one of something, one of her first sins is idolatry. Yes. Of the vehicle of her sin. Yes. Isn't that amazing? Uh, very, we've got a very perceptive reader there. Um, when we fall into sin, we imitate Satan in different ways. And Milton makes this very graphic. As soon as she falls, she or as soon as she eats of that free tree, she starts to pray to the tree. <laughs> it's kind of a classic textbook definition of idolatry. Um, she's imitating the actions, the thought processes, the very language of Satan. And holding, again, it's almost an obverse of Romans 1. She's worshiping the creature rather than the creator. Is Milton's happy fall theology biblical? No, it is not. It's not even coherent Miltonically. Um, Can you tell those of us who are wondering what that question means what the question means? <laughs> if you really want to know, sure. Um, there is one th theory about the fall which, which tries to accord with providence. Okay? Because when humans fall into sin, God doesn't give up on them. I mean, most of you know the gospel story. But there's a, there's a hymn in, in the liturgy, of the, the Roman liturgy, that goes back to the fourth or fifth century. It says, O Felix culpa quaetalem actantum meruit habere redemptorem, which means, O happy fault or happy fall that has merited such and so great a redemption. And yes, amen to the last part of it. But a fault that merits the redemption, there's nothing we do that merits the redemption. And, and some have taken this, this uh, doctrine, this, this not even a doctrine, this exclamation and 
exaggerated it and said, you know, because of the fall, we have Christ. And what would the universe be without Christ? Therefore, we should rejoice that the fall took place. That just seems to me really bad theology. And it's addressed by a number of different people. I can give you references, et cetera, et cetera, but it's, no. Um, a speaker that you had a year and a half ago says, this is a universe that God made and it's got a capacity for real tragedy. And it's not tragedy that's simply papered over by the redemption. Udo Middleman, if you want that DVD. Yes, yes. Um, it's excellent. Milton claimed his inspiration came from a muse. Can you comment on that? Yes. Uh, Milton, um, because he, the form of Paradise Lost is epic. And because the form of epic is classical, he adopts a lot of the uh, trimmings, if you like, of classical epic. But he makes it clear that the muse he's addressing, you heard it when I was quoting it, is above the Aeonian Mount, above the muses of Mount Helicon. And he addresses directly, and chiefly thou, O spirit, that dost prefer before all temples the upright heart and pure. Uh, Milton is invoking either directly God or an aspect of God, hail holy light in book three, it's not the kind of light that's created. Um, he's invoking, really, to put it very simply, God. Would you recommend any introduction to Paradise Lost from any modern writer other than yourself? I don't even know that you have an introduction. You have more comments than introduction, but. Yeah, well, Um, there, are, there are a number of really good ones. C.S. Lewis has quite a good one, a preface to Paradise Lost, even though I argue with various bits of it. Um, Stanley Fish's famous book called Surprised by Sin is a very good introduction to Paradise Lost. And then there are con connection, sorry, collections, anthologies, and I'll name one of them, which I didn't author. I edited it. The Cambridge Companion to Milton, and there's also a Cambridge Companion to Paradise Lost, which I did not edit. So, those are a few. And then the, the last question, which brings us back to the start uh, of my questions, uh, but it's a personal one um, and a practical one. Can you give practical examples of how we can honor and give thanks to God in everyday life? I think that as I get older and perhaps just a little bit wiser, I realize more all the time the profundity of the goodness of God. You might want to sum that up as the holiness of God. And what that calls forth from me when I'm paying attention is uh, deep thankfulness. And if there's, if there's something I can communicate to my students, it's that old attitude of gratitude. And that's gratitude to people, and, but it's also deflected to our maker and redeemer. Amen. Would you join me in thanking Professor Danielson? And Charles, thank you very much. Thank you.